the next item of the next item of business is portfolio questions. Moving straight on, questions on Social Security and Older People, number one, John Scott. Allocates funding from the Scottish Welfare Fund to local authorities. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Welfare Funding is allocated to local authorities in accordance with the formula agreed by the Scottish Government and COSLA. The formula is based on the income domain of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation so that local authorities with more people on low incomes get higher allocations, ensuring that the Scottish Welfare Fund is focused on the most deprived areas. John Scott. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. However, she will be aware that across various local authorities there are different overspends and underspends of the Scottish Welfare Fund. And does the Scottish Government take this into account or believe they should? when distributing the funding for the programme. Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is up to each local authority to manage the budget within that year with, for their local area. It is important that the formula basis is held to. It's based on uh, the deprived areas. As I said to the member, it's important that it stays that way. And therefore, we um, encourage local authorities to ensure that they manage their own expenditure they, they use their allocation up, but we do not take underspend into account as we move on to the next financial year because it's important that we recognise the deprived communities on which that formula is based. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the Scottish Government would not have to provide any welfare support to Scottish local authorities if it was not for the savage cuts to Social Security imposed by the UK Tory Government, backed by Mr Scott? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would absolutely agree with the premise of Mr Gibson's questions. The fact that we have to uh, provide for nearly a third of a million households in Scotland to require a Scottish welfare fund is indeed a sad indictment of the UK government's record on welfare cuts. We have provided uh, money to ensure that the Scottish welfare fund um, is there to provide people in crisis. But what a sad time when we have to once again mitigate against UK government welfare reforms. Question two, Alison Johnson to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported concerns raised by young carer groups that the current proposals for the Young Carer Grant are unduly restrictive. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to co-designing the Young Carer Grant with young carers and stakeholder organisations to ensure that the grant meets the needs of our young carers. The draft regulations that have been passed for scrutiny to the Scottish Commission on Social Security have been amended in line with feedback received through the consultation, user research, the Young Carer Grant Working Group and Young Carer Panels. Alison Jones. Thank you. Um, Greens particularly welcome the decision to allow young carers to be recognised for caring for more than one person. However, the current proposals still only appear to extend only to one young carer, which Carer Trust Scotland says is unfair. When there are two young carers providing support, one would appear to miss out. Will the Cabinet Secretary take action to address this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have moved on a number of issues as the government has developed the regulations as we go through the different processes. As I said in my original answer to Alison Johnson, the regulations are now with the Commission, the, the first set of regulations that the Commission will be looking at, and I look forward to their feedback um, on those in due time. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary knows that carers want to see restrictions on studying ended, support for caring for multiple, multiple people, and changes to the poverty inducing earnings cliff edge. And when the carer's strategic policy statement is launched next month, I can ask the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that the consultation that flows from that is not if the government should introduce those long called for, called for changes, but how carers want to see those policies developed, ready for carers' allowances fully transferred. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the um, announcements and proposals that will be coming forward that Mark McGrenchen mentions are not specifically to do with Social Security, but are on wider carers' issues. It's not a, a, um, a, a development that will be led uh, by myself. Uh, it is important that we look, though, however, at Social Security within a wider context of what's happening for carers within Scotland. We are determined as a government to ensure that we are support carers as we move through that process, both in Social Security and in other aspects and the developments that Mark Griffin referred to will be an important way to ensure that we're receiving feedback from carers and the stakeholder organisations about what they wish to see in the longer term. Question three, Graeme Simpson. 
Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it assists older people to stay in their homes for as long as possible. Minister. Thank you, uh, President Officer. We are absolutely committed to supporting older people to live as independently as possible at home or in a homely setting. This year, we are increasing our package of investment in social care and integration to exceed £700 million. This demonstrates this government's commitment to support older people and disabled people and recognises the vital role of unpaid carers. Last month, the government published the Fairer Scotland for Older People, a framework for action, which identifies actions that will be taken to maximise the contribution of older people and to remove the barriers they face. These include the, in the areas of housing and care, whilst maintaining the need for personal independence. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. I'm sure the uh, Minister would take the opportunity to acknowledge the contribution that care and repair services play in helping older people to live at home independently for as long as possible. Does she agree with me that denying this service to older people, as some councils have chosen to do, uh, by withdrawing funding is unacceptable. Will she give a commitment to review the funding mechanisms that support such services as Care and Repair Scotland and Age Scotland have called for, so that we ensure it's consistent across the country? Minister. Yeah, I know that um, Graeme Simpson is uh, well aware of uh, some of the innovative work that's been done around about all of these areas, including the work with Stirling University and Age Scotland. He will know that care and repair services are something uh, that the local authority would have uh, responsibility for. I've not had any direct issues raised with me on that, but it would be raised with my colleagues in housing, and I'm happy to make sure that the colleagues in housing are aware of the concerns that Graeme Simpson has raised today. Question four, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the 2016 SNP manifesto commitment, whether it will legislate in the current parliamentary session to bring gender recognition law up to international best practice. Cabinet Secretary. This Government is strongly committed to maintaining and indeed advancing trans rights and equality. As with all parties in this Parliament, we want to reform the gender recognition law. And our programme for Government 2018-2019 reaffirmed that commitment to legislation on gender recognition. The majority of the 15,500 responses to the Scottish Government's consultation on gender recognition supported the proposals. But we recognise that some respondents expressed sincerely heard concerns about reform. We will take account of those concerns as we reach our decisions on next steps and we will announce our response to the consultation in due course. Patrick Harvey. I'm glad that the Cabinet Secretary gave a, a, a reminder that the, to the Chamber that all five political parties in this Parliament stood on the manifesto commitments to continue to advance this legislation and the Equality Network's hustings uh, in advance of the 2016 election saw every political party leader give a clear personal commitment to see this legislation brought forward. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that the delay that we've seen since the consultation has also seen the development of a, a much more uh, co coherent campaign against trans rights and equality, including by those who seek to portray trans people as a threat in a way that is reminiscent of previous campaigns against lesbian, gay and bisexual equality. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that there is an impatience to see this legislation introduced and can she give us a timetable? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do appreciate that there are stakeholder groups and indeed individuals across Scotland who are looking to this Parliament to ensure that there is change. Um, there is absolutely um, an imperative on all of us to ensure that this debate is carried out in the right manner and it's done with respect and it's done of recognising different opinions but ensuring that we do so on the foundation of trans inclusivity and of uh, ensuring that trans rights are respected along with other rights in our community. Trans people are not a threat. They never have been, they never will be, but it is important that we listen to people who have concerns to reassure them, to ensure that we're doing everything that we can to reassure those concerns and work through them. Uh, that is why I am ensuring I go through a process of due diligence to look at the consultation responses, to understand the concerns that are out there and work with people to find solutions. And that ask would, I would put out to everybody in this chamber and beyond, if we are committed to ensuring that everyone in Scotland is respected and has a place in our society, then we all have an obligation to come forward with solutions about how we do that in a respectful manner. Joan McAlpine. Thank you. 
I would remind Patrick Hardy, Hardy that one of the groups most concerned about these proposals are in fact lesbians. Nothing in the SNP 2016 manifesto said that males with male bodies, including male genitals, should be able to declare themselves female without any medical or psychological assessment or safeguarding. Trans people are not a threat. It is men who are a threat because men commit 97% of sexual crimes. So what evidence does the government have that males who self-declare themselves as female uh, no longer offend at male rates? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I welcome Joan McAlpine's uh, reaffirmation that trans people are not a threat. And the important point that is picked up um, that there is a, a perceived threat from men who will use the debate around trans rights. Um, and, and that's very important. We recognise it as something that I recognised in a blog I put out in this area. And we tackle that fear that women have of men um, and ensure that we deal with that and also ensure that we develop uh, trans rights in a respectful manner. This government is absolutely determined uh, to move forward with uh, the, the gender recognition um, laws, and it's important that we do that in the, in the right manner. It's important that we ensure that uh, the process that is here at the moment uh, does change, that we listen to the concerns that people have around how we're trying to change this, but we also ensure that people recognise that what the government is proposing is something which would be a solemn declaration that would be made in front of a notary public that would have very, very serious consequences if ever broken. And it's very, very important that we ensure that when we're talking about self-declaration, it is done on the basis of self-declaration in front of a notary public with criminal offences um, actually available to be charged if someone mis uh, abuses that system. And if we can work to ensure that what we're bringing forward recognises those concerns, but also ensures that we are delivering um, a, a system of gender recognition that is fit for purpose uh, for what is going on within the international community, then I think we can move Scotland a long way forward in what is a very, very difficult uh, subject for many of us to find a solution to. I appreciate that was a lengthier answer to a sensitive uh, position, but I, I would like shorter answers, please, just so that everybody gets in. Question five, Bob Doris. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on DWP removal of the protected date of claim guarantees, which previously allowed councils and citizens of Scotland to backdate benefit claims of their clients to the start of the application process rather than the final submission date. Cabinet Secretary. This is yet another... Um, uh, this is yet another area um, where there is a great concerns over universal credit and the effect it's having within people on Scotland. Uh, there are many reasons why someone might not be able to make a claim from the day that they are entitled to make that claim. For example, uh, people might not have digital access. It is therefore important that those uh, protected dates that were available is recognised and the UK government does need to recognise that as well. Bob Doris, briefly. Uh, the removal of these financial safeguards for some of my most vulnerable constituents are alarming and unacceptable. Glasgow City Council have estimated 200 Glaswegians will miss out each and every month because of this. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether she agrees that the flaws in the universal credit system requires to be fixed, not made worse at the expense of the poorest in society, including many of my constituents? And will she join with me in calling for an urgent rethink of these appalling changes for them to be scrapped altogether? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think once again, Bob Doris raises a very important point. I would uh, fully support um, his reasonings behind his question and his calls for action from the UK government. Question six, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. It asks the Scottish Government how much Social Security Scotland has paid out in benefits since the Social Security Scotland Act 2018 was passed. Cabinet Secretary. The Social Security Scotland Act received royal assent on the 1st of June 2018, with Social Security Scotland established on the 1st of September 2018. Since then, the agency has paid out £197 million between the 1st of September 2018 and the 31st of March 2019. This is broken down by £158.5 million on carers allowance and £33.9 million on carers allowance supplement, an investment in carers of over £192 million. Payments of £4.4 million have also been made for the Best Start grant pregnancy and baby payments. Fulton McGregor. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. And she mentioned the best uh, start grant, which is paid out more than two months. And the DWP benefit it replaced did in a whole year, putting money into the pockets of families with children, many of whom have been hit by the UK government cuts. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that this shows the positive difference that we are making to families across all of Scotland with our new powers over Social Security? Cabinet Secretary. Well, this government does want to ensure that our children get the best start in life and using our new social security powers to help make that happen is a very important part of our programme. In the first three months, more than 9,700 families received the pregnancy and baby payment. The Best Start grant takes provision for the first child from £500 under the Sure Start Maternity Grant up to a total of £1,100 over three payments. Subsequent children who receive nothing from the UK Government will receive up to a total of £800. That's an increase of £1,400 more than the UK system for a two-child family in Scotland. Michelle Bantown, briefly, please. Thank you. Last week we heard that Social Security Scotland has spent £9.1 million on temporary and contract workers. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, therefore, how the Scottish Government plans to ensure that we will have enough permanent staff to deliver the remaining 98% of devolved benefits? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the use of contract staff within the programme is an important way to ensure that we have the right skill mix within the programme at the right time. There are also other particular areas where it is better to use a contract staff than a permanent member of uh, the Scottish Government because the types of skills that we require are only required for a short period of time in a particular part of the programme. And that's why we are taking important steps to ensure that we create the right mix of permanent staff, temporary staff and contract staff with a keen eye on the public purse. Question 7, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government how many families in the Highlands and Islands have been awarded a Best Start grant a pregnancy and baby payment since December 2018 and how many had their applications rejected? Cabinet Secretary. Social Security Scotland made around 600 Best Start grant pregnancy and baby payments to families in the Highlands and Islands electoral region by the end of February 2019. During the same period, around 300 applications were denied and a small number were withdrawn. Rhoda Grant. The Cabinet Secretary will know that there are as many as one in five children in poverty in parts of my region. And yet, as she's told us just now, over 300 families had their grant application rejected. A recent report from, the Social, Security, from Social Security Scotland on the delivery of the grant has shown that staff are unclear about the scheme and are working under intense pressure. The guidance is long-winded and the systems are not fully tested. Can the Cabinet Secretary give an assurance that families entitled to the payment in my region got them and that any failures in the system didn't lead to anyone missing out? Cabinet Secretary, briefly. I'll have to say to Rhoda Grant that I absolutely do not recognise her um, assessment of the Social Security uh, Scotland Agency or its workings. And if she would refer to the, the new insights research that is published by Social Security Scotland, which shows satisfaction rates of 98% and 100% for um, online and uh, telephone inquiries, that proves that we have an agency that's based on dignity, fairness and respect. Applications were denied, for example, around, particularly around a new benefit for many reasons, it could be, um, for example, because the people were not on the low income benefits that uh, you have to be to be eligible. We had uh, a number of people who were applying for Best Start Pregnancy and Baby Payments who did not live in Scotland. Um, and we had a number of um, people who were applying um, whose child was not within the, the age range of which the, the developments um, were actually again, the entitlements were actually for. We all look very, very seriously about why uh, there are um, uh, areas where there are different parts of the country uh, where applications are rejected, but I absolutely refute uh, the, the allegation made by Rhoda Grant that there are flaws within the Social Security Scotland system. Uh, people who are uh, um, applying for these grants are getting those grants, and uh, it's a shame that the Scottish Labour Party cannot recognise the success of Social Security Scotland and its staff. I'll just squeeze you in, uh, Liz Smith. Yes, you weren't ready for that. Off you go. Yes, I am ready. <laughs> uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the impact will be on benefit recipients of the expansion to 1140 hours of funded childcare. Must be brief, Cabinet Secretary. A key driver for the expansion of the 1140 hours is the evidence that all children, but especially those experiencing the most disadvantaged benefit from access to high quality early learning and child care, the increase in hours and the new approach to flexibility and choice can make it easier, for example, for families to access work, training or study. 
and the quickest supplementary ever. <laughs> could I just ask the <laughs> could, could I just ask the cabinet secretary um, what contingency measures the Scottish government has got in place for those who are on uh, benefits um, if they're going to have to pay their childcare fees up front because neither the public uh, funded nurseries nor the private funded nurseries have got spaces available. Cabinet Secretary, very briefly. Uh, well, uh, I think it's very important to ensure that, the, uh, that I get the point over to, to, to Liz Smith that the Scottish Government and indeed uh, local authorities and private providers are on track to deliver on the commitment for the 11.40 hours. Um, and in that way, I hope Liz Smith re reassurances that the situation will not arise. Questions on finance, economy and fair work. Number one, Liam Kerr. So to ask the Scottish Government how it plans to protect those employees in North Sea oil and gas as the industry changes. Minister. Uh, as highlighted in our energy strategy, Scotland's oil and gas sector is a key component of our energy system and our economy. It can also play a positive role in supporting the global low carbon transition. In taking forward the aims and ambitions of the strategy, Skills Development Scotland and stakeholders have been working across a number of sectoral groups to ensure alignment of skills planning and delivery. This work will enable pathways for future employment, reflecting the potential impact of challenging demographics while addressing demand, especially in areas such as digital technology, automation and advanced manufacturing. Liam Kerr. Thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will be aware that oil and gas supports 280,000 UK jobs and workers in the energy sector, many of whom are based in the North East, each contribute on average more than £170,000 to the economy. However, Aberdeen Council's general revenue grant is being cut by over £20 million, and our North East Councils face funding cuts of £100,000 per day. Now, given that context, can the Minister tell us when we can expect a fair share for the North East Councils? Minister. Uh, North East Councils, as all councils across Scotland, get a fair share of, uh, of the, the, the support. The Scottish Government support to councils, as you will aware, has, uh, has increased, and the uh, councils in the North East, as across Scotland, get to keep all their council tax uh, payments and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, non-domestic rates receipts. Question two, Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Do you ask the Scottish Government what assessment the Finance Secretary has made of the contribution that immigration makes to Scotland's economy? Cabinet Secretary. Migration is vital to Scotland's population growth and makes an essential contribution to future economic prosperity and delivery of our public services. We know that people who come to live and work in Scotland and across the UK typically contribute more through tax revenues than they consume by way of public services. Research from Oxford Economics published last June found that people who arrived in the UK in 2016 are projected to make a total net positive contribution of £26.9 billion to the UK's public finances over the entirety of their stay. Alec Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Last week, the Federation of Small Businesses revealed that one in ten small businesses in Scotland are led by an immigrant entrepreneur, contributing more than £13 billion to the Scottish economy. During its recent inquiry, the Economy and Fair Work Committee heard that the Scottish Chamber of Commerce that the biz businesses could find themselves in a position where their route to government support is somewhat unclear. Given the lack of transparency... No, I want a question. We're beginning to get a lot of preambles, and I don't yeah. like preambles. Sorry, given that lack of transparency, uh, what consideration has the government given to whether this could deter immigrant entrepreneurs for starting or upscaling businesses in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the Scottish Government has welcomed the FSB report. There's a reception this evening. I think it's been hosted by Stuart McMillan, MSP. Jamie Hepburn has engaged with the FSB in relation to this report. And I do agree we should look at further ways to support entrepreneurship, business growth and scaling up of those migrant entrepreneurs who are building very successful businesses in Scotland's economy and contributing to our shared prosperity. Jackie Bailey, briefly, please. The Minister further on this because despite immigrant led SMEs generating 13 billion and 107,000 jobs, they struggle. Growth is erratic, exports activity is poor. So, can I ask the Minister, is sufficient support available from Scottish Enterprise and Business Gateway to help immigrant led SMEs flourish? And what, what, what more can be done? Cabinet Secretary. As Jackie Bailey is well aware, as a member of the Economy Committee, Business Gateway is led by local government, but yes, we are proactively looking at that, partly as a consequence of the committee's uh, inquiry in that regard. And in terms of Scottish Enterprise, yes, I do believe uh, that there is uh, support there, but I do actually want to do more, and that's why we'll engage further with the FSB uh, and other business representative organisations to try and support those groups who, for whatever reason, 
feel that financial products and support is, hasn't been there for them. So yes, we do want to address that and of course celebrate the economic, social uh, contribution that migrants have made to this country. Question three, Linda Fabiani. <coughs> uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how to encourage employers to commit to having living wage accreditation. Minister Kate Forbes. Thanks. Scotland has over 1,400 living wage accredited employers, which is proportionally over five times more than the rest of the UK. And to support our ambition to be a fair work nation by 2025, we've provided £380,000 to the Poverty Alliance this year to support employers through the accreditation process and to drive that commitment to lift at least 25,000 additional workers to at least the real living wage by 2021, focusing on low pay sectors, including hospitality, to help those most affected by low income levels. Linda Fabiani. Uh, can I ask the Minister to join with me in recognising the excellent initiative of XL Vending in East Kilbride in becoming a living wage employer to mark the 25th anniversary of their company and thus encourage other employers to consider this way of marking special milestones in their company's development? Minister. I certainly can join with Linda Fabiani in congratulating them on 25 years and recognising that they have committed to fair work practices which obviously improve staff retention and productivity as well and hope that that success of that business will encourage others to follow suit. Question four, Anna Sarwa. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the amount of reserves required for a new central bank in the event of a separate Scottish currency. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first, our proposals are to keep the pound in the immediate term. A Scottish National Party Government will take the steps that are necessary to enable the Scottish Parliament to authorise the preparation of a Scottish currency as soon as is practicable after independence. The Sustainable Growth Commission, which was established by the First Minister in her capacity as SNP leader, produced a detailed report on the financial, economic and regulatory requirements necessary for the transition to an independent uh, currency. It engaged extensively with businesses in developing its recommendations. It recommended the introduction of six tests to guide that transition, one of which is the financial requirements of Scottish residents and businesses. Our position is clear. Until a new currency can be safely and securely established in the interests of the economy as a whole, the currency of an independent Scotland should continue to be the pound sterling. Anna Sarwar. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but I don't think that sounds like they've done any assessment of what a foreign exchange level would need to be. So let me help him. Professor Macdonald of Glasgow University and the Adam Smith Business School has estimated an independent currency would require £40 billion of foreign exchange reserves in order to run a managed system. Does the Finance Secretary, who sets the budgets of this Parliament, understand that means more cunts, higher borrowing and tax rises? Cabinet Secretary. No, I don't accept that at all. But I am delighted, however, that Anna Sarwar is also scenario planning for Scottish independence. That's a very welcome uh, revelation. Uh, the six tests have been outlined uh, within the uh, Growth Commission's uh, documentation. And I would have thought that Anna Sarwar would welcome the fact that an economic plan on independence would be an alternative to austerity that we have endured under the Tory government. So we have outlined uh, the tests that we would apply uh, as we transition to an independent country, making the right decisions for Scotland's economy. And as I've said, on independence, Scotland will keep the pound. Marjorie Fraser, followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, Deputy Spending Officer. Uh, are we any clearer what the transaction costs will be to Scottish businesses if we have a different currency here in Scotland from our largest market in the rest of the United Kingdom? I, Cabinet Secretary. I, <laughs> I'd like really, to hear the answers, please. Uh, presiding officer, I would really encourage anyone with a genuine interest in how we can grow Scotland's economy to read the Growth Commission report and read the resolution that was supported at SNP conference. And it sets out how we can grow our economy, deliver a more successful uh, society using the levers and the powers of independence. And in terms of currency, it goes through all the requirements that would have to be fulfilled to enable us to move to an independent currency if that was in the interest of the economy at the time, which would be advised by a Scottish central bank. It's all laid out in the Growth Commission documentation. I'd encourage opposition members to read it. Bruce Crawford followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary, for the sake of Anna Sarwar and indeed other members in the Chamber who haven't obviously read the Growth Commission or these proposals in depth, can he confirm, can, 
Can he confirm? I can't hear the question. Yes, it's a very Please. good question, President Officer. <laughs> can he confirm that the tests that would guide any move to an independent currency includes the sufficiency of foreign exchange and financial reserves to allow for the successful currency management in a successful independent Cabinet Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, of course, uh, convener for brevity. We have tried to cover the six tests previously, but again, it's fiscal sustainability, central bank credibility and stability of debt insurance, uh, financial requirements of Scottish uh, residents and business, sufficiency of foreign exchange and financial reserves, fit to trade and investment patterns and correlation of economic and trade cycle. Those are the tests that we would apply. But what independence gives us is choice. It gives us economic powers. It gives us levers currently denied to us so that we can make the right decisions for Scotland's economy. And any decision on currency would be taken by an independent Scottish Parliament. That's right. The right to choose is what this party is seeking for Scotland. Patrick Harvey. Isn't it amusing to hear those who argued vociferously against a currency union a few years ago and still argue against sterlingisation, quite rightly so, now say how outrageous it would be not to continue to use the pound? Does the Cabinet Secretary share my uh, feeling of looking forward to seeing these parties finally have to make a decision about what currency option they would support when Scotland votes for independence? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the only currency that uh, Labour and the Conservatives understand is austerity. That's what we've endured uh, by consequence of their economic uh, policies. Uh, the UK government cannot stop an independent... I know the opposition don't like this right now, but it's the case that the UK government cannot stop an independent Scotland from using the pound. Uh, we don't need their permission to do that. Sterling uh, retention is perfectly open to the people of Scotland. But so too are the choices that come with independence. And that's why we want the levers of independence. When we looked at the most successful small advanced economies around the globe, the only thing that they've got that we've not is independence. Now, i have let that run because it's important questions. All of them are important, of course, but I want the rest to be short and snappy. Question five, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how much revenue it expects to raise from the large business supplement in Central Scotland in 2019-20. Minister. The member knows the non-domestic rate system is administered by local authorities and so information on revenue raised by the large business supplement is not currently available at constituency level. In 2019-20, we forecast the supplement to raise £8.3 million in Falkirk and North Lanarkshire, and a further £16.5 million is forecast to be raised in South Lanarkshire, reflecting their role as the designated authority responsible for collecting receipts from electricity generation, transmission and distribution subjects. Alison Harris. I thank the Minister for her answer. This financial year, businesses in Falkirk will pay £1.75 million more than they would if they were based in England. Can I ask the Minister whether it remains the aim of the Scottish Government to implement the Barclay recommendation to reduce the large bus business supplement by 2020 and earlier, if affordable? Minister. Probably re uh, reflect the, the national trend too that over 90% of properties in Scotland will pay a lower poundage in 2019 20 than they would in other parts of the UK. They will also benefit from the most generous rates relief scheme in the UK, which includes taking over 100,000 properties out of rates altogether through the small business bonus scheme. And it was only a few weeks ago that a Westminster committee recommended that the UK government adopt the Scottish government's unique business growth accelerator. So we accepted the, the Barclay Review recommendations around the large business supplement, but in the meantime, we're making sure that Scotland is the best place to do business. Question six, Andy Wales. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to further strengthen the economy of Glasgow. Minister Ive McKee. <clears throat> uh, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting and unlocking economic growth across Scotland. And in Glasgow, our focus on delivering key infrastructure has helped establish the city as a home for innovation and secure new jobs, including through inward investment. <laughs> We're also, work, we're also working in partnership with others. Our £500 million commitment to the Glasgow City Region deal has empowered local and regional partners to develop a transformational programme of investment that will help drive inclusive economic growth for the city and right across the region. Annie Wells. Thank you for that answer. Earlier this year, the Managing Director of Glasgow Airport, Mark Johnston, forecast that the airport was set to lose 1 million passengers from the levels we saw in 2016. We've also seen Ryanair axe many of their routes serving Glasgow due to a failure to cut air passenger duty. 
Now that the Scottish Government has performed a U-turn on their commitment to cut air passenger duty, can you explain how that decision will do anything to support future growth at Glasgow Airport? Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting our, uh, our airports and, uh, and recognises the importance of that to our economy. But the member will be aware that the reason that the air departure tax hasn't been transferred is because of issues with the UK Government's running of that scheme over a number of years. And the member will also be aware um, of the uh, importance of the climate change emergency that we're facing and the issues need to be addressed as a consequence of that. Question 7, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the most recent official statistics on Scotland's economic growth. Cabinet Secretary. The latest official statistics on Scotland's economic growth were published by the Scottish Government on the 1st of May in the GDP quarterly national accounts for 2018 quarter four. These confirmed that the Scottish economy grew by 0.3% in the fourth quarter of 2018, higher than the UK rate of 0.2%. In 2018, the value of Scotland's GDP per person, including offshore oil and gas, increased to £32,800, higher than the UK average of £31,900. The first estimate of GDP growth for 2019, quarter one, will be published on the 19th of June. Uh, Joan McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I'm delighted to hear of the strength of Scotland's economy. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that the biggest threat to this continued success is a Tory Brexit, particularly so in rural areas like the south of Scotland, which the government's analysis showed had one of the highest proportion of workforce in sectors most exposed by a no-deal Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. Assessment, uh, that assessment is accurate, uh, presiding officer, but particularly a no-deal Brexit uh, threatens uh, recession, business contraction, soaring unemployment from record low levels of unemployment of 3.3 per cent right now, uh, reduced exports. So it is true to say that any form of Brexit will damage Scotland's economy and a no-deal Brexit would be catastrophic. Question 8, Maurice Corrie. Ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to capitalise on the skills of veterans returning to the labour market to benefit the Scottish economy. Minister Ivan McKee. The Scottish Government aspires for Scotland to be the destination of choice for those leaving the armed forces. We recognise the challenges faced by those undergoing resettlement and taking the next steps in their careers. We work closely with partners to ensure armed forces leavers are aware of training, development and employment opportunities available and to improve the support available to veterans and their families. Skills Development Scotland are also working with the Career Transition Partnerships Regular Forces Employment Association so that early leavers will be referred to SDS for support post-discharge if they wish to take up this offer. Maurice Corrie. I thank the Minister for his answer. We are seeing several veterans who have good technical skills being taken on by companies such as BT Openreach. Would the Cabinet uh, Minister agree that the time is now right for the, the more concentrated effort encouraging more trades-based apprenticeships to be taken up by our veterans? Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Um, and the Scottish Government and SDS recognise the challenges for those who are undergoing resettlement um, and, as apprentice, uh, and uh, apprenticeships and skills are a key part of that. Um, and it's important that all service leavers planning to settle in Scotland are fought and formed over apprenticeships and skills offerings to ensure that those service leavers planning to settle in Scotland can access SDS services. Um, and SDS is currently working with partners, including the Scottish Government Strategic Working Group, to raise awareness of those offers. And I would also like to uh, let the member know he's got a keen interest in these matters. Earlier this week, I visited the Scottish residence, uh, Veterans Residence in Glasgow in my constituency. Um, I'm wearing their tie um, and it was delighted to see the huge amount of work that they're undertaking in this very area to focus on employable employment opportunities for, uh, for veterans. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. Just a short moment while members take their positions for the next debate.